Welcome to Lesson 2 of SPM Bible Knowledge. Let us bow our heads and pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together to study your Word. Please, Lord, open the eyes of our understanding that we may be able to see and know what you want to teach us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us review our memory verse from last week together. Do you remember the reference? That is right. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. For there is nothing that God cannot do. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. Now can we close our eyes and repeat that once again? Luke chapter 1 verse 37. For there is nothing that God cannot do. Luke chapter 1 verse 37. That is lovely. I hope you have written that in your notebook. Now, what are some of the key lessons that we learned from last week? That's right. God is going to do a wonderful thing to save his people and to save the world. And God sent the angel Gabriel to make the announcement to two people. First of all, to Zechariah, and then to Mary. That he is going to do a wonderful thing to save his people and to save the world. Secondly, it is important to believe what God says, although it may seem impossible. Do you remember how Zechariah reacted when the angel told him that his wife Elizabeth would bear him a son? Oh dear, yes, Zechariah doubted it, and for that he was punished by the angel and was struck dumb for nine months. But when Gabriel told Mary a message that she was about to become pregnant. What did Mary do? She believed his message. She was only curious to know how it would happen because she was not married yet. Therefore, it is very important to believe what God says, although it may seem impossible. And the reason is, with God, nothing is impossible. Three key lessons that we learned last week. Now, have you done your written assignment? Have you brought your notebook with you? Open your notebook and let us take a look at the dialogue of the angel with Mary. The angel talks with Mary. Do you remember the new word we learnt last week for a conversation between two people? That is right, a dialogue. This is the angel's dialogue with Mary. Question number one. What four things did the angel say about the son that Mary was to give birth to? Question two, why did Mary think it was impossible? Question three, what did the angel say to convince Mary? Question four, what was Mary's reaction? Now, let us take each question one at a time. The first question, 
What four things did the angel say about the son that Mary was to give birth to? That's right. Number one, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. Number two, the Lord God will make him a king like his ancestor David. Number three, he will be king of the descendants of Jacob forever. And number four, his kingdom will never end. Now, if you have these four things written down, give yourself a big clap. Question two, why did Mary think it was impossible? That's right, I heard some of you answer it. It was because she was a virgin. Do you remember the meaning of a virgin? Hmm. A girl who is not married yet and who has not had any sexual relationships with a man. Number three, what did the angel say to convince Mary? Here we have the answer. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and God's power will rest upon you. That was the first thing the angel told her. Secondly, the angel told her, Your relative Elizabeth is now six months pregnant, even though she is very old. And lastly, the angel said, For there is nothing that God cannot do. The fourth question, what was Mary's reaction? Mary accepted what the angel said will happen to her. What do you think this shows about Mary's attitude and Mary's faith? She had a remarkable faith in God, didn't she? Don't forget, Mary was a teenager at that time and she was not married to Joseph yet. But she was willing, willing to be the instrument that God would use to bring the Messiah into the world. So Mary had a remarkable faith in God. Plus the fact that Mary was submissive to God. She was willing to submit herself to God's will and purpose for her life, even though it involved something that was very difficult that would happen to her, that she would become pregnant without being married to Joseph yet. She was only just engaged. Remember that? Yes. So Mary had a remarkable faith in God and Mary was submissive to God. Well done. Are we ready to move to today's lesson? Let us take lesson two and our lesson will go from chapter one, verse 39 to verse 80. Chapter one of Luke, verse 39 to verse 56, first of all. And that covers Mary visits Elizabeth. And the second part of today's lesson will be the birth of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, verse 57 to 80. Let us take the first part. Mary visits Elizabeth. And in verse 39, of your textbook on page four, we read the following words. Soon afterward, Mary got ready and hurried off to a town in the hill country of Judea. Now you will remember 
that last week Mary had said to the angel, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. And soon afterward, Mary got ready and hurried off to a town in the hill country of Judea. And here I have a map of Judea covering the district of Galilee in the north right down to the province of Judah in the south. Here is Nazareth, the town in which Mary lived and where the angel Gabriel appeared to her. She would travel all the way past Jerusalem to a little town where the priests used to live. And one would think that a more direct route would be to pass through Samaria. But do you know, at that time, the Samaritans and the Jews hated one another so much that the Jews who wanted to leave Galilee to go to Jerusalem to the temple would take an indirect route and they would travel this way. They would travel and cross over the Jordan and travel on the eastern side of the river Jordan until they came near to Jericho when they would cross over to come up to Jerusalem. And near Jericho, the hills would begin. There were fords in the river here and they were able to cross the river easily. But when they got to Jericho, it was a very difficult climb up the hills right up to Jerusalem and past Jerusalem to a little town by the name of Ein Karem, where the priests lived. Let me show you pictures of this area of the deserts of Judah. Let us take a look at the deserts of Judah. The last part of Mary's trip was across the mountainous regions of the Judean desert. Here is the River Jordan and these are the plains around the River Jordan. Once you get to Jericho, you begin to climb up. And it was an uphill climb all the way to Jerusalem and past Jerusalem to Ein Kerem. And these are pictures of the geographical terrain that Mary would have to walk through. Look at how brown and dry the desert of Judea was and the steep hills that rose from the river valley up to the hills and the dry and barren hills as far as the eye can see. And do you know these paths here are where people used to walk and these trails here are where they would walk. And here is a picture of a man walking through the desert of Judea. And here is some, the same map reminding us of the route that Mary had to take. And it was probably a four-day walk for Mary. And in verse 40, it tells us that when she reached Ein Karem, she went into Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby moved within her. Wow! Certainly, this was a confirmation of the angel's words to Mary. How were the angel's words confirmed? Remember, the angel had said to Mary, Remember your relative Elizabeth? It is said 
that she cannot have children, but she herself is now six months pregnant, even though she is very old. And in Luke chapter 1 verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby moved within her. Wow, Elizabeth certainly is pregnant. And in verse 42, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she said in a loud voice, You are the most blessed of all women and blessed is the child you will bear. Why should this great thing happen to me that my Lord's mother comes to visit me? For as soon as I heard your greeting, the baby within me jumped with gladness. How happy you are to believe that the Lord's message to you will come true. Let us take a look at Elizabeth's message to Mary. Because the baby jumped in her womb, Elizabeth was given the information from the Holy Spirit that Mary would be pregnant with the Messiah. And she declares that Mary was the most blessed of all women. And blessed is the child that Mary would bear. And she is wondering, why should this great thing happen to her? That the mother of the Messiah, the mother of my Lord, should come to visit me. For as soon as I heard your greeting, the baby within me jumped with gladness. And how happy you are to believe that the Lord's message to you will come true. Why do you think Elizabeth said these words to Mary? What had happened to Elizabeth for the last six months? That's right. Elizabeth has had to live with a husband who had come home to her from his duty in the temple and he was unable to speak. Zechariah had been struck dumb by the angel. You remember that? And Elizabeth had had to suffer for six months with a dumb husband. And Elizabeth knew that Mary had believed the Lord's message to her. And now Mary, inspired by the Holy Spirit, sang a song. And we often call that song the Magnificat. And she sang this song to glorify God. And in older versions of the Bible, this song begins with, My heart magnifies the Lord. My heart praises the Lord. And so this song is called the Magnificat. Now let us read together from verse 46 to verse 55 together. And I want you to take out your hand out one. There are certain blanks in hand out one. And as we read these verses together, I want you to pick the word that you need to fill in the blank. So as we read all the verses together, pick out the words that you can find to fill in the blanks. Are we ready? Verse 46, Mary said, My heart praises the Lord. My soul is glad because of God my Saviour. For he has remembered me, his lowly servant. 
from now on all people will call me happy because of the great things the mighty God has done for me. His name is Holy. From one generation to another, he shows mercy to those who honor him. He has stretched out his mighty arm and scattered the proud with all their plans. He has brought down mighty kings from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has kept the promise he made to our ancestors and has come to the help of his servant Israel. He has remembered to show mercy to Abraham and to all his descendants forever. Now, have you found the words to fill in the blanks? Let us see. All right, my next slide will show you the answers. I hope you have filled in the blanks by now. I'll give you 30 seconds to fill them in if you have left any blank unfilled. All right, are you ready for the next slide? Now give yourself a tick if you have got the right word. Number one is, my heart praises the Lord from verse 46. Number two is, my soul is glad because of God my Saviour from verse 47. Number three is, he is a mighty God from verse 49. Great things the mighty God has done for me. Number four from verse 49 again, his name is holy. Number five, he is kind from verse 50. From one generation to another, he shows mercy to those who honor him. He is a kind God. Number six, from verses 51 to 53, he is righteous and just. Why do I say that? He has stretched out his mighty arm and scattered the proud with all their plans. He has brought down mighty kings from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He is certainly a righteous God who has done away with the injustice in the land and he is a just God as well. Number seven comes from verse 54. He has kept the promise he made to our ancestors and has come to the help of his servant Israel. So the word for the blank in number seven, he has kept his promise to his servant Israel. And number eight from verse 55, he has shown mercy to Abraham and his descendants. Have you got eight marks, eight ticks for this? Well done. Now, what can we discover about God from Mary's song? Yes, of course. We have already found out 
that the first thing is he is a mighty God and the second thing is he is a holy God from verse 49 at the end and the third thing is he is a kind God because he blesses those who honor him number four is he is a righteous God because he corrects injustice from verse 51 to 53. And he is a trustworthy God from verse 54 because he keeps his promises. And from verse 55, he is a merciful God. He has remembered to show mercy to Abraham and to his descendants. Six characteristics of our God. A mighty God, a holy God, a kind God, a righteous God, a trustworthy God, and a merciful God. I want us to take time to note the contrasts in the Magnificat. The first contrast is in the moral realm, where Mary talks about the proud being scattered with all their plans, and she begins with, God has remembered me, his lowly servant. She realizes that she herself was poor in spirit and so in the moral realm there is the proud versus the poor in spirit. In the realm of social things, socially, it is the mighty versus those of low degree. In verse 52, he has brought down mighty kings from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. And in the physical realm, he talks about the hungry who toil and pinch versus the rich who need nothing. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. So there are three contrasts that Mary makes in the Magnificat, in the moral realm, in the social realm, and in the physical realm. And let us take a look at the analysis of the Magnificat. First of all, in verses 46 to 49, there is a thanksgiving for God's gracious condescension as shown in the incarnation of His Son. Oh dear, there are some very big words in this sentence. Condescension, incarnation. What does condescension mean? To condescend is to go from a higher position to a lower position. God's gracious condescension. When God sent his son Jesus to earth, Jesus, the Lord our God, condescended, came down from heaven to earth. And what about the incarnation of his son? The word incarnation simply means a spiritual being revealing himself in a physical form. How Jesus, our God of eternity, the invisible God, took on the visible form of a man. He became first of all a little baby 
and then he grew into a man, the incarnation of his son. So verse 46 to verse 49 is a thanksgiving for God's gracious condescension as shown in the incarnation of his son. I want you to take a pen and against verses 46 to 49 in your textbooks, you put one thanksgiving. That is the first portion of the analysis of the Magnificat. Mary said, My heart praises the Lord. My soul is glad because of God my Saviour. For he has remembered me, his lowly servant. From now on, all people will call me happy because of the great things the mighty God has done for me. His name is holy. Secondly, it is a declaration of faith in God's mercy and providential rule. Another big word, providential. What does providential mean? Providential rule refers to God's rule over the whole planet Earth. God in his mercy grants us the sun to shine by day and the moon by night. He commands the rains to fall and he stops the rain at his pleasure. And in verse 50 to 53, we have Mary declares her faith in God's mercy and providential rule. Let us read verse 50 to 53 again together. From one generation to another, he shows mercy to those who honour him. He has stretched out his mighty arm and scattered the proud with all their plans. He has brought down mighty kings from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. Certainly, God has raised up certain kingdoms and brought them low when the kings became proud in their hearts and forgot about God. He has brought down mighty kings from their thrones and lifted up the holy. So in your textbooks, write down number two, declaration of faith. Number three, we have a recognition in the coming of Christ of the fulfillment of God's covenant. And that is found in verses 54 to 55. And what does the word covenant mean? The word covenant simply means a promise made, a promise that God made to his people, a promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And the third part of the Magnificat is a recognition in the coming of Christ of the fulfillment of God's covenant. Let us read verses 54 to 55 together again. He has kept the promise he made to our ancestors and has come to the help of his servant Israel. He has remembered to show mercy to Abraham and to all his descendants forever. Now, I want you to write against verses 54 and 55 the third word recognition. And so you have from verse 46 to 49 a thanksgiving 
for God's gracious condescension as shown in the incarnation of his Son. And from verse 50 to 53, it is a declaration of faith in his mercy and providential rule. And thirdly, in verses 54 to 55, it is a recognition in the coming of Christ of the fulfillment of God's covenant. All right, the analysis of the magnificent. Now, what about verse 56? How long did Mary stay with Elizabeth? And verse 56 tells us, Mary stayed about three months with Elizabeth and then went back home. My, when Mary went home, how long would Elizabeth have been pregnant? When Mary first arrived at Elizabeth's house, Elizabeth was, that's right, six months pregnant. Now Mary stays with her for three months. Altogether, Elizabeth by then was nine months pregnant, almost ready to give birth. And what do you think these two women did together? Mary, a young teenager, with her cousin Elizabeth, who was very old. And there was Zechariah the priest in the house. I am sure they must have talked about the angel's visit to Zechariah over and over again, and the angel Gabriel's visit to Mary over and over again. And then they must have studied the Old Testament scriptures together to find out what God had to say about the coming of the Messiah. They must have done many Bible studies together over a period of three months. And there was senior Elizabeth showing the young Mary how she and Zechariah had lived a life of faith and obeyed God in every commandment and law that God had given to the Jews. And Mary must have asked Elizabeth many questions. And Mary must have talked and asked Elizabeth about pregnancy and in her first three months being pregnant with the Lord Jesus in her womb, she and Elizabeth would have rejoiced together. So at the end of the three months stay, Mary went back home to Nazareth. Now, are we ready to move to the second part of our lesson today? And the second part is the birth of John the Baptist. And that takes us from verse 57 to verse 80. And where did Zechariah and Elizabeth live? That is right. They lived in the small priestly town of Ein Karem, a little way out of Jerusalem. And so that verse 57 tells us the time came for Elizabeth to have her baby and she gave birth to a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard how wonderfully good the Lord had been to her and they all rejoiced with her. How lovely! Her neighbors and relatives all came together and they must have fussed around her 
for a whole week because she was so old and she never ever thought she would have a baby and now she had given birth to a baby and he was a boy and in verse 59 when the baby was a week old they came to circumcise him and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father but his mother said no his name is to be John they said to her but you don't have any relative with that name then they made signs to his father asking him what name he would like the boy to have why do you think they made signs to Zechariah I'm sure in their excitement they must have forgotten that he was only struck dumb and not deaf and in verse 63 Zechariah asked for a writing pad and wrote his name is John how surprised they all were Wow now I want to take a little bit of time to talk about this sentence here in verse 59 when the baby was a week old they came to circumcise him a week old he was eight days old a week had passed and circumcision you know the Jews are one group of people who circumcise their baby boys we in our country here the Malay boys are circumcised but that happens when they're 12 years old this circumcision for the Jews was a part of the ceremonial law of Moses but it was first given to Abraham it was instituted by God in Genesis chapter 17 verse 12 when God told Abraham that he must circumcise all the men folk in his family and when Isaac was born he was circumcised at the age of one week old this circumcision was a sign of God's covenant with Abraham that God would bless Abraham and all the descendants of Abraham forever and that God would bless the whole world through Abraham's descendant when he sent the Messiah into the world this covenant this agreement was made between God and Abraham and between God and Abraham's descendants and this circumcision was to be performed on every male child in a Jewish household and this was to be done on the eighth day of a baby's life Wow on the eighth day of a baby's life wouldn't it be very painful when the little child is only eight days old and yet how did Abraham way back in the Old Testament days about 4,000 years before our modern science and modern health was discovered this circumcision on the eighth day of a baby's life was only practiced among the Jews how did Abraham know that on the eighth day 
of a baby's life. Vitamin K or prothrombin, which is a blood clotting agent, is fully developed in the baby's body. They didn't know anything about vitamins or prothrombin in those days, but God, our Creator God, certainly knew because He was the one who created our human bodies. And he knew that on the eighth day, the blood clotting agent was fully developed. And circumcision practiced among Jewish male babies on the eighth day of the baby's life certainly proved that the God of Israel is the creator of mankind. All right, reflect on that. Now, we read together the argument that Elizabeth had with her relatives and neighbors. Her relatives wanted to name the baby Zechariah after his father, but Elizabeth was very firm and adamant and she said, no, his name is to be John. So, of course, the relatives and neighbors were not satisfied with that. They had to have the man of the family give his word. So they went to Zechariah and they made signs to him. And he signed back to them and asked for a writing pad. And when they gave him the writing pad, they were so surprised when he wrote down his name is John. And immediately in verse 64, at that moment, Zechariah was able to speak again and he started praising God. And Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and he spoke God's message. Now, that was a real miracle, wasn't it? For nine months, all these relatives and neighbors had interacted with a dumb Zechariah. And the minute he wrote on the tablet, his name is John, he was able to speak again. What had the angel said? You will be struck dumb. You will be silent until the day when my words come to pass. And what had the angel prophesied? He had prophesied that Zechariah would name the baby boy John. And the minute Zechariah wrote his name is John, he was able to speak again. And the neighbors were all filled with fear. My goodness, Zechariah, you're able to speak again. My, they were all filled with fear. And the news about these things spread through all the hill country of Judea. You remember the hilly country that I showed you in the map? And in verse 66, Everyone who heard of these matters thought about it and asked, What is this child going to be? For it was plain that the Lord's power was upon him. And in verse 67, John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he spoke God's message. Now close your eyes and try to recall the word miracle. And try to recall its spelling. How do you spell it? M-I-R-A-C-L-E. Yes, a miracle is something that happens 
out of the ordinary. And Zechariah was able to speak again. And he spoke God's message. Let us read from verse 68 to verse 79 together slowly. Are we ready? Verse 68. Let us praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to the help of his people and has set them free. He has provided for us a mighty savior, a descendant of his servant David. He has promised through his holy prophets long ago that he would save us from our enemies, from the power of all those who hate us. He said he would show mercy to our ancestors and remember his sacred covenant. With a solemn oath to our ancestor Abraham, he promised to rescue us from our enemies and allow us to serve him without fear so that we might be holy and righteous before him all the days of our life. You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High God. You will go ahead of the Lord to prepare his road for him, to tell his people that they will be saved by having their sins forgiven. Our God is merciful and tender. He will cause the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us and to shine from heaven on all those who live in the dark shadow of death, to guide our steps into the path of peace. Now, what does verse 68 say? Let us praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to the help of his people and has set them free. And in verse 69, he says, He has provided for us a mighty Savior, a descendant of his servant David. Zechariah said God had come to the help of his people and has set them free. But the Jewish people were not set free. They were still under the dominion of the Roman Empire. However, in verse 69, Zechariah said, God has provided for us a mighty saviour, a descendant of his servant David. Zechariah's prophetic message, part one, was a thanksgiving for the provision of a mighty saviour. He has provided for us a mighty saviour, a descendant of his servant David. That is the Lord Jesus. And what about his second prophetic message? It is found in verse 76. Let us look at verse 76 together. You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High God. You will go ahead of the Lord to prepare his road for him. You see, from verse 68 to verse 75, he is thanking God for the coming of the Messiah, for the provision of a mighty Savior, a descendant of his servant David. And in verse 76, he turns to look at his baby boy and he says to John, you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High God. You will go ahead of the Lord 
to prepare his road for him. What was John to be? He will go ahead of the Lord to prepare his road for him. John was to be a forerunner of the Messiah. And what is a forerunner? Today, when our Agong goes for a drive on our roads in Kuala Lumpur, he has a troop of forerunners who go ahead of him. A troop of men dressed in uniform riding their motorbikes and they go ahead of the Agong's car and with their horns the cars in front of them will know to move to one side to allow them and the Agong's car to pass and this troop of motorcyclists is called the troop of forerunners of the Agong. They go ahead of the Agong to prepare the road to be cleared for him to drive. And John was to go ahead of the Lord to prepare his road for him. So Luke chapter 1 verse 69, he has provided for us a mighty saviour a descendant of his servant David is a prophecy about Jesus. Luke chapter 1 verse 76, You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High God. You will go ahead of the Lord to prepare his road for him. Is a prophecy about Zechariah's son, John the Baptist. So Zacharias Benedictus can be divided into two parts. And why is Zacharias' song often called the Benedictus? Do you know that the word in Latin for blessed is benediction? Benediction is a blessing. In many churches, the priest or the pastor at the end of the service will stand up and pray and give the benediction. He will give the blessing for the people. So Zechariah's song is called the Benedictus. And the first part of his song goes from verse 68 to verse 75. It is a thanksgiving. Let us praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to the help of his people and has set them free. He has provided for us a mighty saviour, a descendant of his servant David. He promised through his holy prophets long ago that he would save us from our enemies from the power of all those who hate us. He said he would show mercy to our ancestors and remember his sacred covenant. Remember the covenant with Abraham? With a solemn oath to our ancestor Abraham, he promised to rescue us from our enemies and allow us to serve him without fear so that we might be holy and righteous before him all the days of our life. The first part of the Benedictus is a thanksgiving for our redemption by Christ. And the second part of the Benedictus is a prophecy of, of the mission of John the Baptist, reminding us of the constant need of repentance as a preparation for the coming of heaven and carrying our minds forward to Christ's second coming. Now, there is a lot said 
in point two, isn't there? Zechariah is prophesying the work of his son John the Baptist. What was John to do? John would go out and publicly preach the message of repentance. When the people repented from their sins, they would be given the forgiveness of sins and thus become able to enter the kingdom of heaven. And John the Baptist was to go ahead of the Lord Jesus to prepare the way for the coming of the good news of the kingdom of heaven. John's message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be a preparation for the kingdom of heaven to come when Jesus came. And towards the end of the Benedictus, where Zechariah says, our God is merciful and tender, he will cause the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us. And in verse 79, and to shine from heaven on all those who live in the dark shadow of death. In the dark shadow of death. That is a reference to those who did not know God's word, who were living in the darkness of the shadow of death. That would be the Gentiles. So God would shine his bright light the bright dawn of salvation to rise and shine from heaven not just on the Jews but on all those who live in the dark shadow of death, the Gentiles, to guide our steps into the path of peace. When would perfect peace come? Perfect peace will come to earth when Jesus comes back again. And that is the Benedictus carrying our minds forward to Christ's second coming. So the second part from verse 76 to 79 is a prophecy of the mission of John the Baptist, reminding us of the constant need of repentance as a preparation for the kingdom of heaven and carrying our minds forward to Christ's second coming. All right, that is the analysis of the Benedictus. It has two parts. First of all, a thanksgiving for our redemption by Christ, verses 68 to 75, and secondly, a prophecy of the mission of John the Baptist, verses 76 to 79. Now, what does Luke's Gospel tell us about how John grew up. In verse 80, the last verse that we will read in this section, the child grew and developed in body and spirit. He lived in the desert until the day when he appeared publicly to the people of Israel. The child grew. I wonder at which age of John the Baptist that he lost his parents. Remember that Zechariah and Elizabeth were very old 
when John was miraculously conceived in Elizabeth's womb. And so, as John grew, I do not know whether he had become a teenager when his parents died or whether he was still an infant. Whether he was still a young boy when his parents both died. But John lived in the desert as he grew and developed in body and in spirit. I'm sure that as soon as he became able to learn some Hebrew alphabet, his parents must have taught him to read the scriptures and as he grew physically in body, his spirit and his knowledge of God's word also grew. His father was a priest and both father and mother lived very godly lives. They had obeyed every law and commandment of the Lord. But soon he moved out to the desert of Judea and he lived in the desert. As a young lad, he would run up and down those hills. And by day, he would scoop up river from the water from the springs and drink. And in another gospel, it tells us that he fed on locusts and wild honey, which he found in the desert. And he grew until he became a man. Until the day when he appeared in public. And that would be when he was about 30 years old. When he began to appear in the region around the River Jordan and he preached publicly to people who would listen to him. But do you think he would have preached before he reached the age of 30? I think he would. I think he would have gone to the synagogues and with his long hair and his hairy look, perhaps the people would have looked at him. And people in his own town, Ein Karem, would have known that he was the child of his aged parents. And many of them would have given him food. His relatives and neighbors would have given him food. And when he was about 30 years of age, he appeared publicly to the people of Israel. He lived in the desert. By day, he would run up and down the mountain sides. By night, on hot nights, he would sleep out in the open air and look up at the skies and the stars and the moon and the skies were his roof and how he enjoyed the outdoors. Now, what else do you think we can read into this one verse? You see, the Gospel of Luke is a biography about the Lord Jesus. And John the Baptist was to be his forerunner. And so the author, a doctor, Dr. Luke, does not tell us very much about 
John's early life. Dr. Luke is eager to hurry on with the story and he can hardly wait to get on to the birth of the Lord Jesus, which is found in chapter 2. And so in this one verse and from the fact that Ein Karem was very near Jerusalem, we can infer from that that John roamed around the desert and up and down the hills until the day when he appeared publicly to the people of Israel. All right, now I want to give you a home assignment. In his song called the Benedictus, Zechariah praised God for what he was doing, for what God was doing, and for what God was going to do. I want you to take your notebooks when you are at home and write down from reference to verse 76 to 79, the prophecy that Zechariah made about his son, John the Baptist. What did Zechariah say about what his son John will do and list the things that Zechariah prophesied about John the Baptist. All right? For example, in verse 76, what did Zechariah say that John will be called? So the first thing is that John will be called a prophet of the Most High God. And number two, in the second part of verse 76, what did Zechariah say John would do? That's right, he said that John would go ahead of the Lord to prepare his road for him. So I want you to take verses 76 to 79 and to list down all the things that Zechariah said about what his son John will do. Now, let us take a few moments to discuss the most important thing that we have learned in this lesson. What have you learned? Share with your friends in the first one or two minutes what you have learned in this lesson and then we will discuss it together but I want you to share with your friends first and after you have shared it with your friends I want you to write it in your notebook right turn around and share it with your friends as to what you have learned in this lesson.
Now, are you ready to write down the lessons that you have learned? Let me share with you what I have learned from this lesson. I have learned that God is faithful. He remembered his covenant to Abraham and he had sworn with a solemn oath to the ancestor of the Jews, Abraham, to provide them with a mighty savior and to set them free. And not only is he faithful, he keeps his promises. As he had made the covenant with Abraham and his descendants 2,000 years before the coming of John and before the coming of Jesus. Now he keeps his promises to Abraham. So two important things about God that I have learned. That he is faithful and that he keeps his promises. Now have you written what you have learned in your notebooks? You might like to write these two statements down. All right? I give you 30 seconds to write these two statements that God is faithful and that he keeps his promises. Right? Have you written that down? Now, before we end our lesson, I want us to read together Luke chapter 1, verse 78. Luke chapter 1, verse 78. Let us read this verse together. Our God is merciful and tender. He will cause the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us. Luke chapter 1 verse 78 God is merciful and tender. He will cause the bright dawn of salvation. The coming of the Lord Jesus is the dawn of salvation. And he will not only shine on the Jews, he will shine from heaven on all those who live in the dark shadow of death. And this is a reference to the Gentiles, to us. God is merciful and tender. He is merciful because he chose Mary, a tender maid, one who was righteous and had won God's favor. And he lovingly brought the Savior and his forerunner into the world. Both were miraculous births, the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of the Lord Jesus. Our God is merciful and tender. He will cause the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us. And today, Jesus has come. 
Jesus is the bright dawn of salvation that has risen on us. Let us say this verse together again. Say the reference first. Luke chapter 1 verse 78. Our God is merciful and tender. He will cause the bright dawn of salvation to rise on us. Luke chapter 1 verse 78. Now shall we close with prayer? Thank you God for our study and help me to trust you. Please take care of us in the coming week. Thank you for being a faithful God and thank you for keeping all your promises. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Bye. I will see you next week.